Now, intentional or not, Tucker Carlson just did the world a strange favor. He showed how deluded and dangerous Putin really is. Yeah, I know. The interview was last week, so it took me a few days to do this video. But I already put some reactions on my blog, so I put a link in the description. For more detail, please look at that, because I list and provide links to things that Putin said and that you should pay attention to. Let me preface this by saying that I typically don't agree with Tucker Carlson, but I do believe in free speech. I do believe that people should be allowed to say what they want to do. And if someone wants to go to the Kremlin and do an interview with Putin, okay. I also think the interview maybe didn't go as either of the two had expected. Now, we know that Carlson for a while has been in this strange spot where what he has been saying about Putin's war against Ukraine seems to echo some of the Putin propaganda already, some of the Russia repeater stuff. <clears throat> and we're all familiar with that argument. And after the interview, Tucker said it again. So sometimes it helps to not react immediately, but to wait a little bit. Yeah, so... Tucker already drew all the wrong conclusions from it, that Putin wants to talk, which he doesn't, that Ukraine should just stop fighting and everything will be over, which it won't, and that we should stop helping Ukraine, which he shouldn't. Yeah, so he draws these false conclusions, maybe because some of that mirrors his politics, but also because... Putin is a very good propagandist. And so the interview is illustrative of that. We can also see some things that Putin maybe didn't intend to show. Now, so what, what are we learning from it? Again, I'm not going over every detail here. Look at the blog article. But there's some fascinating pieces in there. In his weird and distorted history lecture. And I'm saying distorted because it isn't correct in many parts. He says that Poland began World War II by not letting Germans take back territory they lost after World War I. And also by not letting the Soviets move forces to Czechoslovakia. Bad Poland. That is extraordinary. That's straight up Nazi propaganda. Remember, Putin is going on all about denazification, but this is directly out of the Nazi playbook. Yeah, the mythology that the Nazis tried to spread was that Poland attacked the Leibniz radio station and that then Germany just shot back and that they defended themselves. So, for someone who accuses Ukraine of being Nazified, that's an interesting perspective, to say the least. It's offensive. It is wrong. It also reveals that to Putin, Nazi Germany may have had a right to take back territory because it was German. Now, no territory in Europe belongs to anyone forever. We know that historically. I mean, nothing in Europe has been really stable. The most stable border is probably the border between what is now France and what is now Spain, but most other borders are not. So that tells you something. He, he believes that great powers have an inbuilt right to the territory they want. 
He isn't saying that Poland has a right today to terry the territory that was once Polish in Ukraine and Lithuania. I mean, he could, because that's also part of the propaganda that they're spreading. No, his perspective is centered on Nazi Germany here. The other interesting bit is he admits to the existence of the molotov ribbentrop or Hitler-Stalin pact. That's fascinating because in recent years in Russia, this information has been put on the down now. What the molotov ribbentrop pact meant was basically that the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany were allies. They were allies. So when Germany attacked Poland, a few days afterwards, the Soviet Union attacked Poland from the other side. Both started World War II together. Hitler would not have attacked Poland if he had not known that the Soviet Union would do what they would do later. The Soviets also invaded other countries, but let's stick to the Polish situation here. So Putin here admits that the Soviet Union under Stalin was allied with Nazi Germany. Of course, that ended when later Germany invaded the Soviet Union, and then things went the other way. But as to the point about denazification, well, oh boy. So here we see that the way Putin understands history and draws lessons already makes no sense. Of course, he'll go on about Stepan Bandera late, later, ignoring the fact that, you know, the Soviet Union was allied with Hitler, ignoring the fact that a lot of Holocaust survivors who after the war went to the Soviet Union because they were communists were actually killed by the Soviets. And all of all of his narrative has holes in it that are really just outrageous. He also doesn't know Russian history, or, well, he knows it, probably, I assume, but he gives you the ideologized fake version of it. It's correct that Russian and Ukrainian history are somehow interrelated because the Kievan Rus is the original Russian. The conclusion of that insight might be that actually Russia has to cede territory to Ukraine because Russia has failed at being real Russia and Ukraine may be the inheritor. So careful what you wish for. All those maps that the Kremlin keeps putting out about which territory was given to Ukraine at which point in time as a gift I mean, we've seen this all before. Nothing there is new. Then he goes into, well, the one thing about the interview that really speaks for Tucker Carlson is that his facial expressions towards Putin are, those are not just micro expressions. These are all, all, all almost macro expressions. I mean, he, he must think the guy is nuts. Of course, he won't say it, but we know Tucker Carlson has said things in the past, in chats, in messages that he wouldn't have said on his television station. I mean, anyhow, let's not go into that. So after all this detour, Putin then claims falsely that there was a coup in Ukraine. Well, Viktor Yanukovych, according to experts from the OSCE, rigged the election. So people demonstrating at him, they demonstrated because he rigged the election in order to do Putin's bidding. So this is not a coup. This, is an oust, this was an ousting of a fake president, a president that had enriched himself had a private zoo. And we, if you paid attention, you saw all those pictures. 
The violence on the Maidan was started by Yanukovych's shock troopers, the Berkut. They started shooting on peaceful protesters. It's not like the Ukrainians violently went against the government. It's the other way around. The Maidan revolution also was the third attempt to distance Ukraine from Russia. The first was when Ukraine became independent under Kuchma. The second was the Orange Revolution by Yushchenko, who was poisoned by Putin, or Putin's people, probably, and Timoshenko. And the third now is the Maidan Revolution. Putin denies that Ukrainians can have any ideas or feelings of their own, so he assumes that the West did it, but that narrative makes no sense. It would make sense if the Maidan came completely out of the blue, but it didn't. It was part of a continuous process of leaving the Russian world. Ukraine, for decades at that time, had wanted to join Europe. So did Russia for a while, allegedly. So when what Putin calls a coup happened, he claims this is now his excuse to save Crimea because it was in danger. Crimea wasn't in danger. The Russians had attempted to derail Ukrainian politics, and Ukrainians were mad, and they then said, well, why should you have the Russian fleet in Sevastopol? But it's because of what Russia did, not because of any mischievous ideas in Ukraine. Then he says that Ukraine started attacking Donbass, ignoring that the Donbass was invaded by, by people like Igor Girkin and the name of Strelkov and his people. So first Russia steals Crimea, then they steal Donetsk and Luhansk, put up these fake republics, and Ukraine isn't supposed to try to get their territory back after Russia incites a, a real coup, a real military invasion of their own country. Give me a break. So he, again, blames the victim as the perpetrator, like he did Poland blaming Poland for World War II and Ukraine for the war he unleashed in 2014 and then escalated in 2022. That's the mindset of a rapist, of a criminal. You made me do it is the oldest excuse that perverts have used throughout the years. Then you have this bit about NATO expansion. NATO at no point has threatened Russia. NATO at no point promised not to expand. There have been some politicians, like Egon Ball that he mentioned. Egon Ball wasn't kind to East Germans, if I remember correctly. I, I grew up at the time. He, in my view, was always a little too beholden to Soviet interests. I may be wrong on that, but that's the appearance he had. I mean, this long trajectory of Western politicians somehow being really afraid of Russia, and also of some German politicians who think that because Germany attacked the Soviet Union, we now need to be differential to Russia. Yes, a lot of Soviet lives have been lost by Germany's attack. Yes, we need to pay deference to that. But I can separate these two. I can say, yes, Germany attacked the Soviet Union. A lot of Soviet people died. The Soviet Union was instrumental in deposing Hitler. I'm thankful for that. But then the Soviet Union imprisoned and enslaved peoples all around Europe and Asia. So I can distinguish between these things. One good act by the person one sacrifice, or, or, or by, by his country, or one sacrifice doesn't excuse everything. In this case here, recent history, Russia is the perpetrator. I can say that. After 1945, 
the Soviet Union was the perpetrator. I can say that. I don't, just because of what happened before, I don't have to be blind to truth and history. So NATO was created as a defense against the Soviets. How can you trust a country that used to be allied with Hitler, then invaded by Hitler, and then created a regime of terror in all these states? So how much of the Soviet Union's philosophy was influenced by Russian imperialism? So in the 1990s, could have thought, okay, Soviets are gone, let's abandon NATO. That would have been possible if, if there would have been a clear answer that without the Soviet Union, Russia would be peaceful. Anybody knowing the history of the Russian Empire knows that wouldn't be so. So proof to the contrary it would have been Russia to have to prove that it had changed its ways. Every country that applied for NATO membership did so because of what Russia historically had done to them and also because of what Germany had done to them. So NATO is there to solve the problems historically caused by Russia, Soviet Union, and Germany. That's why it exists. And that's why so many smaller countries and mid-sized countries wanted to join because they were afraid. And Russia proved eventually legitimately so. And just be because a few politicians say things like, yeah, yeah, we won't expand NATO. By the way, they did this to the Soviet Union, not to Russia. They said this to Soviet. Soviet authorities, not to Russian authorities. Just because some people said this on their private time or as political ideas, it's meaningless. Before treaties are signed, people say all kinds of things, all kinds of aspirational things. But then when actually the negotiations happened, when the treaties were signed, it became clear now. No, NATO had every right to expand because NATO expansion is nothing else than other countries seeking protection by NATO against, you know who, whoever may endanger you, whoever may be interested in correcting what they think of as historical wrongs. Russia agreed with that. Yeltsin approved NATO expansion. I lived through that time. I, I saw the news. I read about this. I mean, NATO was legitimately expanding. So, that's maybe the main, the counter to some of the main arguments. But what is most damaging is that Putin claims that Ukraine and the West weren't interested in honoring the Minsk agreements. Well, Putin didn't honor the Budapest Memorandum. In the Budapest Memorandum, Ukraine and other countries gave up their nukes and their security was guaranteed, their territorial integrity by Russia, the United States, and I believe the United Kingdom. Anybody in the United States who says or in the West, that we don't owe Ukraine anything. Yes, we do, because we signed this memorandum. We promised to save Ukraine in case of attack. If we stop helping Ukraine, the damage to our reputation is going to be immense. You know, so, and part of the Minsk agreement was also to move heavy weaponry away from the border, which Putin never did. So given that he is the aggressor, 
The Minsk agreement should have led first to the demilitarization of the Donbass and Crimea, which Putin never did. And so why should Ukraine have followed anything else? But in Putin's mind, Russia can do no wrong. Then he claims that the West threatens with nukes. No, it's Putin's buddy Medvedev, who every Thursday, like clockwork, threatens the West with nuclear weapons. Now, it's a strategy. Putin also claims that in Istanbul, there was almost a peace agreement. Yeah. What happened was, that may have been the case, but then news from massacres in Bucha, Irpin, and other cities came up. So it became clear that Russia was not interested in just getting Ukraine to recognize the realities on the ground. It was interested in genocide. Russia is deliberately bombing civilian cities without provocation. The Russian mission is to kill as many Ukrainians as they can, and those that survive to torture them and to remove their Ukrainianness from them. That's what denazification means. So that became clear during these meetings in Istanbul. Do you really want to sign a peace treaty with a genocidal butcher? Knowing that wherever Russia is, Ukrainians will be tortured and killed, the children were removed and indoctrinated by Russian propaganda? No. Again, Putin leaves critical details out. Now, Tucker Carlson doesn't say anything to any of that. No. I grant that going to the Kremlin is a dangerous affair for a Western commentator. And in the end, Carlson also calls for the liberation of a Western journalist to his credit. Also, he's not the only one fawning over Russia, we know. I've watched a four-hour Oliver Stone interview from, I believe, 2017, after the war already started. And if you get mad at Tucker Carlson, you have a right to do so, but then also get mad at Oliver Stone. Or all those people in the West repeating Russian lies. But there are things that Tucker has put in say that actually bring out the truth. So either this was in, his intention all along, or sometimes even a broke clock shows the right time twice a day. He asks Putin when the war will be over, whether he has enough territory. Putin evades it. So it's clear. No, no. Putin isn't done. He wants more. Putin also admits that he wants to continue to cleanse Ukraine of what he calls Nazis and remove the Ukrainian identity. He admits to his genocidal intentions. When asked about Nord Stream, <laughs> Putin makes this weird evasive joke that, well, you know, you know who it was. No, we don't know who it was, and it doesn't matter. Anybody who believes that the destruction of the Nord Stream pipelines means anything doesn't know what really happened. What happened was that Russia unilaterally stopped delivering gas through those pipelines. They were not carrying any gas anymore. Also, the pipelines were deliberately built in order to circumvent Ukraine, in order to weaken Ukraine's economy. They were built already as a weapon. Russia unleashes that war. Whoever, if it wasn't Russia, destroys them. That's what Russia invited them to do because they were weapons of war. They were not just gas pipelines. They were meant to destabilize Ukraine. But there is a Russian motive to blow them up. Putin says, well, look at who benefited, but Russia benefited. Russia deliberately stopped delivering gas for no reason. It would have had to pay huge penalties. 
if these pipelines get blown up by some unknown actor, well, Russia could say, well, we would have delivered, which again, they didn't. And so the question of who benefits is oftentimes, it sounds intuitively correct, but oftentimes it leads you astray. So that if you ask who benefits, then Russia benefits as much. But it's a it's a it's a it's a misdirection. The pipelines are meaningless. Gas didn't flow anymore. Also shows one of the fears of Putin is that he fears climate change legislation, which would move us away from coal, gas, and oil, hopefully, hopefully soon. And that's a danger to a Russian business model. Just before the war, the European Union was in conversations with Ukraine about building solar farms, wind farms, and stuff like that. Ukraine also has nuclear energy that they exported to the West. Guess why Russia is occupying the Saporizhia power plant? But the most fascinating thing is how Putin thinks the West is so powerful that they're behind all this. He is afraid of the West. He's afraid of the United States. It tells you he doesn't believe he can win. He says he believes it, but you know, he's a skilled liar. He also talks about the sanctions in a way that yeah, I mean, you know, they're hurting him. Yes, Russia can import things still, but at much higher prices. Their economy is suffering. The economy by now consists of illegal imports, war making, war production, all probably not as effective as he wants us to believe because there's corruption everywhere. Millions of competent people have either fled or died. So Russian economy is suffering. And he knows it. That's why he so desperately wants to have the war end right now. He's also somewhat afraid of China. He knows if he plays his territorial game, what belongs to whom, Manchuria. That's all I have to say. He makes a mistake also because he doesn't know Western politics as much as he claims he knows. He praises President George W. Bush a frequent target of Carlson's and Trump's critique. That's not a good move. So whatever he wants to achieve here, his target is well. Putin is really not informed about what Trump is all about. He doesn't really praise Trump. And when Carlson asks him about tr basically traditional values, conservatism, religion, the old KGB agent doesn't know what to say. So if you are a conservative, if you believe in traditional values, in religion, in anything, that cannot be scientifically measured. If you have this desire to somehow hold on to a world that is changing much too fast, Putin isn't your guy. He doesn't even understand it. Huh? Again, KGB, what do you think he is? I also don't know why Putin felt it was good to insult Tucker Carlson as not having made it to the CIA. I don't know what that was supposed to be about. Anywho, so what do we get out of this? Tucker Carlson isn't the only one in the West who somehow may project some hopes on Putin to curtail neocon 
tendencies in the US. He isn't the only one who somehow has an outsized fear of Russia and thus feels that we need to appease Russia at all costs. He isn't the only one in the West that somehow doesn't quite trust Ukraine yet to be a fully functioning democracy. Well, Ukraine is on its way. It's not perfect. Who is perfect? But Ukraine is the victim here. Ukraine was attacked. Russia has to learn its lesson. Russia has to be defeated. This genocide has to stop. If Ukraine falls, all our promises will be seen as worth nothing. It will be the second big blow after Afghanistan. This is what Putin wants. He wants us to be weak. If you believe in America first, if you believe in democracy, freedom, justice, you can't be for Putin. We also shouldn't want Russia to be destroyed, but this is not what this is about. This is about Ukraine defeating an aggressor and retaining, regaining its territory and its people. This war can only end one way if it's supposed to end in a good way, by restoring Ukraine and by teaching not just Russia, but aggressors everywhere, you can't get away with this. If we want a safe world, if we want to just live in peace in a more or less, well, as much as you can, a reliable future, you need to help Ukraine. Putin has shown he's delusional. He's a, he lies, he distorts, he won't stop, and don't believe anything he says. We also learned that it's that that Putin's hold over the West, or some people in the West, is strong. But it probably can be broken. We need to just keep educating ourselves and remind ourselves what we stand for, what he doesn't stand for. So that's my takeaway for now. Thank you very much. I'm Dr. Philip Kneitz. This is Erratic Attempts. Like and subscribe if you want. And uh, I'll see you soon.